uh, as it was already said, we work for Risk here. We're both security analysts there, so we daily our daily work is basically to, to look into the, the security of embedded devices, smart cards, smart meters, uh, pay TV systems. You think of it, we can probably hack it for you. And yeah, that's, that's us in a nutshell. This talk will be focused on the uh, host card emulations for Android and mobile payment security of the host card emulation applications. So what we'll cover today is uh, the basics of the host card emulation uh, technologies, uh, a little bit overview of uh, Android platform and security, the attacker model for host card emulation payments, the attacks and countermeasures, that's the most of our talk, the tools that the attackers can use and the things to keep in mind when you are developing and defending the HCE applications from malicious attackers. So the first thing about the uh, evolution of uh, NFC transactions, uh, we all have seen the contactless smart cards, but the progress uh, keeps moving the transactions into the user's devices, into the smartphones that get equipped with NFC. And here we're talking about Android smartphones and uh, Android NFC transactions. Uh, the normal NFC transaction is supposed to have a secure element that serves the same purpose as a real plastic smart card, the banking smart card serves. It protects uh, the necessary key material, the secrets. The NFC reader contacts the Android device through a radio interface, the NFC radio interface, and accesses the secure element for the actual transaction. But there are some issues with this uh, scheme because the secure element uh, is not present in all devices. Technically, the embedded secure element is present only a small fraction of the devices that are in the market. Uh, th there are multiple parties manufacturing the secure elements in forms of SIM cards, SD cards. There are parties that manufacture the actual chips that get embedded into Android smartphones. And the coordination between the parties trying to implement a payment application utilizing the secure element is a real issue. Uh, there are some issues um, between the financial institutions providing payment services, the issuer banks, and the vendors of uh, the secure elements. And uh, yeah, the device support is quite limited. Only a fraction of the devices have the integrated uh, secure element. A fraction of devices nowadays have SD cards, so you cannot really insert an SD card with a secure element embedded into it. So the uh, next step of the evolution was to remove the secure element and try to do a host card emulation, try to emulate the smart card in software. Uh, the benefits of that are quite obvious. So now the issuing banks are independent from the vendors of the secure elements, from the mobile network providers, uh, and they can uh, rapidly develop their application to meet the consumer needs. Um, but the security remains an issue because there is no hardware to provide assurance and to protect the key material. So as Nikita already pointed out, there's a big difference between the security of a, a hardware platform and a software platform. So for example, in the smart card situation, it is indeed in hardware. So those the hardware chips are developed to be uh, resistant against fault injection, side channel attacks, uh, pretty much any type of attack you can think of. On the physical level, they will try to withstand, and those have been tested for years and years now. So those are actually quite secure. Also, the software that's on such a device so here, you don't want to really have an interface. Yes, you have a couple of chip pads that you can talk to, but they have a very limited uh, protocol that you can use. So to actually get to the code that is running on such a chip, it's really difficult, and it's really yeah, hardened against attack from people trying to, to lift the code from such a chip. On the smartphone, on the other hand, there is usually no extra hardware security. There is no secure element, as Nikita already pointed out. There's no extra functionality that gives you uh, a trusted environment or a trusted uh, part of the phone that you can store some credential in or some unique identifier. Additionally, the software security is also questionable because, as you all know, software is not bulletproof. It's very easy to actually attack software. And if you have a phone which has software on it from 10 to 100 different providers, there is quite a big chance that one of those software pieces is going to be quite vulnerable, and thus it might actually escalate to a, a full-scale attack. So the biggest question we have here is, can we run secure applications on a smartphone? What do you guys think? I'm seeing a lot of people nodding no, so I'm going to guess with that. I think we, uh, we agree. 
so let's uh, think how the uh, trans contactless transaction is being protected when we're talking about the HC. So we have a terminal and the device uh, running an application and the user that is supposed to authorize himself uh, and authenticate between the device to by entering a mobile payment pin, for example. Uh, normally, when you do a payment transaction in the shop, uh, the transaction details uh, are sent over the NFC to the application, which presents some kind of uh, consumer device uh, verification mechanisms to the user, prompting him to enter the PIN and kind of approve the transaction from the user perspective. Then the application signs the transaction using the key material present inside it, uh, the same way as a payment smart card signs a transaction with the cryptogram. And this signed transaction is being relayed back to the terminal and the terminal connects to uh, the acquiring uh, financial institution and the payment networks to conclude the transaction. Uh, there are several assets uh, participating in this uh, operation uh, and the main is the key which actually proves that the device has has participated in the transaction. The second main asset is the user PIN. It proves that the user has consented uh, to the transaction and that the transaction is not fraudulent. It's a legitimate transaction. Uh, when we uh, think about the Android payment ecosystems on a uh, little bit larger scale, uh, we, when we do an HC uh, transaction, we need a server to actually prove uh, and secure the key material. So normally, uh, instead of uh, personalizing a normal payment smart card, as it being done uh, in the classic uh, credit card payment, uh, the provision phase is being shifted uh, between the application running on the device and the server running uh, in the uh, cloud payment provider. Provider. So the account information, the key material, all the configuration data are, are being uh, entered into the application after its installation, and then the user can make payments, actually. Uh, then, when the payment's being relayed to the payment network, the payment network asks the cloud server of the backend, uh, is the transaction really approved? As now, in this scheme, uh, in contrast to the classic smart card payments, the issuer has to relay on the cloud server provider that the for example, to authenticate the device, which is a little bit different. In the classic smart card payments, the cryptogram is the only thing uh, really authenticating the smart card, and the issuers uh, have sufficient assurance that the payment is being signed by the smart card issued by them and not by the malicious attackers. Um, a little bit of review of the Android platform security. Yeah, so Android has a number of different strategies that it uses to, to protect applications. So generally there's application signing, so the developer can sign an application which makes sure that the application is actually from that user. So that if you want to upgrade, they have to check to make sure that the signature is still the same. Android has a sandbox which prevents apps from talking to each other or talking to the Android main system itself. So the idea is that it stays within its little sandbox and it can only play with uh, its own assets. There is the permission system which gives quite generic permissions that allow you to, to uh, allow the application to access specific parts of the system, but disallow it to access other parts of the system. And there's a key store, which is either software or hardware backed, which allows you to save specific key material to the phone. And that uh, you can write it to the key store once, and then afterwards you can use the key store to encrypt data or that kind of thing, but you cannot get the key out of the key store again. At least that's the idea. <clears throat> so for Android, there's a number of different uh, uh, malware threats. So first of all, if you get malware on your device, that malware can actually sign manipulated transactions. So if the malware contacts the app directly and basically just tells the app to do something while you're not present, then the, the malware can effectively impersonate you. <coughs> the malware can also dig deeper into your application and basically inject the, the crypto, which basically also uh, means that if you're doing a transaction and the malware decides to change, like, hey, you're paying five euros for your coffee, and instead it, the malware says, well, you're paying 500 euros to this attacker's bank account instead, and the crypto just signs that key, and you click your PIN and you enter OK, then it's just signing away, and you don't know the difference. There's also the third possibility, in which case the malware actually manages to extract the key, and depending on what type of key store you're using, if you're using a key store, <coughs> the key might actually be available for an attacker to take. And in that case, they can take the key, they can reproduce the entire application, they can just go sit wherever they want to and just use your key to sign any transaction they want to. One big mar remark about the entire uh, threat here is that attacks are scalable, which means that if you take the effort to, to attack one application once, generally that attack will scale to every application or every instance of that application on every Android device. 
So if you manage to get the malware that has uh, root capabilities and uh, works for, say, uh, one specific bank's payment application, and you manage that to spread that to every phone that uh, uses that bank's payment application, then you can probably access every user's bank account using the same application. So you write it once, and then afterwards you can just spread it and gain the benefits. So Android has a, a large number of vulnerabilities. Uh, every version of Android tries to patch as many of those as possible, but every time they patch a lot and then another new vulnerability is found. So basically here, we, uh, the Android vulnerabilities team wasn't really registering the, the current statistics, so they're not sure if those versions of Android were or were not secure. But basically every time a new version of Android is introduced, the number of uh, uh, vulnerabilities decreases until a new exploit is found, in which case generally pretty much all Android devices are found to be vulnerable to this new bug. Then the Android or Google will actually patch the bug, but only the get Google Nexus versions are typically patched immediately and the other uh, uh, patches are rolled out through uh, internet service providers or uh, telecom providers or phone providers, which means that it will take a long time before all the vulnerabilities are actually patched on all devices. And you can see this is really a fight against the clock because every time they try to patch everything and then a new vulnerability uh, comes up. That basically means that on average about 80% of the Android devices are vulnerable to some kind of exploit. One of the main and most important exploits on Android is rooting. I'm going to skip through this quite quickly. Basically what rooting means is that you have full super admin rights on the system. You can access files, memory peripherals, interfaces. You can basically get around all OS protection without any detection or, uh, yeah. Android will just let you do whatever you want to. Generally, it's achieved by exploiting an OS, uh, an OS bug, so either in the kernel or in some application that has kernel rights. And pretty much all attacks start by getting root on the device. So the impact of rooting, any phone can be rooted, because as we saw, pretty much 80% of all Android devices is vulnerable at some point, and a lot are also vulnerable after a new exploit comes out. Any application can be reversed, because it's Java bytecode, and Java bytecode can be reversed back into Java and at that point it's quite easy to actually read the code. So if you can read the code, you can kind of find out where the vulnerabilities are, you can exploit those, and it's quite easy to actually get access to the system. Any asset may be compromised. As we pointed out earlier, Android does not really have a hardware uh, protection against assets being exposed, so everything is stored in software, and as we already pointed out, software can be attacked, and so you can also get to the assets. And we come to the next question, is there actually any hope for mobile software security? Yeah, so let's see what kind of attackers uh, are there outside and uh, what have we as a developer of the uh, host card emulation software uh, take into consideration. Uh, there are attackers of varying levels of expertise uh, from the ones that simply buy some uh, malicious software as in, in the form of exploit pack to uh, the actual expert criminal attackers that, that do the research and start the attack. Uh, what we have to acknowledge is that the attacker can eventually achieve full control of the device because, as it has been said, most of the devices are vulnerable and can be rooted. Uh, the attacker can mount scalable attacks because the devices are connected to the internet and it's easy to trick the users into installing the malware. Uh, the attackers will uh, interact with legitimate users uh, using a variety of social engineering techniques. So the attacker is quite powerful. What can we still do? about it. So uh, let's talk about the countermeasures uh, and the attacks related to them. Uh, the main concept for a developer of a payment solution is the endless psychological warfare on attackers. Uh, there has, be, uh, has to be a balance between the efforts that the developer undertakes to roll an application in the market and uh, the budget and the effort of the attacker trying to do that. Uh, HCE uh, is um, an agile development cycle. So there, has, uh, there is a possibility for the developer to stay ahead of the attackers by developing fast and uh, uh, splitting the uh, scope of damage, compartmentalization of the assets. The first uh, step to pr prove that your application is kind of secure from the attackers is to detect if the device has been compromised by routing. Uh, so some, oops. 
there are some simple techniques. We'll zoom into the slide a little bit more. But basically, uh, the first step is to check that the routing tools are present in the phone's file system. Uh, the second uh, kind of checks are the checks that uh, check for the processes running on the smartphone, and especially the processes that are associated with the common routing tools. Yeah. So as you may have already noticed, we're dressed a bit differently. I'm dressed typically as you would expect a developer to be dressed. He's dressed as a typically an attacker would be uh, dressed, I guess. We're going to show you that the attacks on Android typically come from uh, the unexpected corner. So in this scenario, I'm going to be attacking the, scenario, the, the application, and Nikita is actually the one that developed these pieces of code. So to give you an example, Nikita wrote this root detection script, and I'm going to get to show you how to get around it. So we're going to attack each little function individually. So here, initially, it checks to see if the device is rooted, and it checks three different methods. And each, if any of those methods return true, then the device is considered rooted, and our application will just close, and it will not work on this device. So we're going to attack. So the first method is actually checking to see if the Android build tags contain the test keys string. So Android has a number of different properties in its file system that show whether it's a debug build or a production build or whether it's uh, what kernel it's running, what kind of uh, all kinds of different properties. And one of those properties is actually the, the build uh, tags. And that's going to be either test keys or release keys. Release keys means that it's a production build, and test keys typically means that it's a debug or a prototyping build. And in this case, the routing check is actually testing to see if it is a debug or a, a Product, uh, prototyping build. So if I want to prevent my phone from being detected as rooted, I'm going to, going to change that debug flag to release keys, which is what it should be on a production device. And since I have root on my device, I can just change that flag. So this check is now worthless. The next check, which basically checks for different types of uh, files on the file system which have to do with routing applications. So if you want to root your device, one of the most common things to do is to install the super user APK file, which is just a package which gives you a number of binaries which allow you to raise your privileges to root very easily. So this check quite simply just checks to see if there is a super user APK file on the file system. There's also the SU binary or another SU binary or in different places to see if that binary is ex existent, which allows you to get super user rights. Since I'm root and I really don't care what this APK file is actually named, I can just rename it to something else. And with the different name, this script will not actually detect it anymore. And I don't care what it's called because as long as it works, hey, I've got root on my device and I can just attack this application. So now this check has also become quite useless. The third check is this one, which basically does the same thing, except instead of checking for the exact location in the file system, this one checks to see if there is a binary which responds to the name SU, and if so, it returns the address of that binary on the file system. If we rename that binary to something else which is not SU, then again, this check will fail, and routing is not detected, so I've now managed to get root on this device, and the application will not actually detect that the device has been rooted. The next thing uh, we can do is to check for the presence of the common development tools that the attackers will use. So the first is the presence of the debugger. Uh, the second thing, we will check if the attacker is trying to run our application in an emulator in order to understand it and reverse engineer it. So we employ some of the checks. Yeah. So also I want to note that uh, these checks are very far from being a complete set of checks. There's a lot more checks you can do, of course. This is just as an example. But uh, yeah, so I have root on my device, and I'm wondering, well, what if I can just modify the entire check itself? I mean, I have root. I can access everything in memory. I can access everything in the file system. Like, what can I actually do? So we know that in Java, or in actually in pretty much every programming language, if you have a function that's doing something, you have basically a caller that's calling something, and you have a callee, or actually the address that it's trying to access. And that can be a function, it can be a class, it can be a var variable, or pretty much anything that you commonly see in, in this kind of thing. What if we intercept this call itself, and instead we hook it with our own function? And in that case, we can change pretty much everything we want to do. We can write our own function, so we can replace the entire function. We can replace the variable that's being called. We can replace the, constant, the contents of the variable. We can add additional functionality. We can remove functionality. And yeah, we can 
lock the, the function so we can tell it to still do the function, but lock the address that is actually accessing. We can prevent things from happening. We can modify the parameters. We can modify the return values, and we can replace the function completely with whatever code we want to execute. So in this case, we have a really nice check debuggable check that checks to see if the application is debuggable. We have a very nice check emulator check, which returns a Boolean to see whether or not the emulator is actually tampered with, or if it's running in an, em if it's running in an emulator. And we can just remove those two functions, and I'll have it always return false, in which case our application is now not in the debuggable state and not running in an emulator while it actually is. So again, we have managed to make these checks completely worthless. Uh, let's think what else can we do as a developer to prove that our application is temper resistant. Uh, the first thing that comes to mind is uh, the runtime integrity checks. Our code that's running, especially the native code that we deploy on the device, uh, has a possibility to check itself. We can uh, implement in line, uh, self-check the code that reads the code from memory and computes the checksums and validates them. We can check the whole APK package. We can check its hashes, uh, check the signer of certificate. We can also hash any part of the binary code as the whole native library itself. Uh, there is also a possibility to use the device profile and risk assessment mechanisms provided by the vendors or even by the Google itself. Uh, we can also use some uh, extensive anti-debugging checks. For Java, we can ask the Android framework to provide us the information whether the debugger is connected over JDVP protocol. We can try to self-debug from native code uh, as doing a ptrace on itself to check if uh, there is no other process ptracing ourselves. And we can also check for lots of environment variables and Java properties and environment properties of the Android application. Yeah. We can also attack those. So. One thing to do is to make the environment more stealthy. So if Nikita is asking the Android environment to, to see what kind of things are set, if there are debugging flags set or that kind of thing, I can also just tell the environment to not indicate those flags. I can move and rename binaries as I already indicated. I can also intercept APIs in user mode. So if and, uh, Nikita is using a specific API to ask something of the, the Android OS, I can also just intercept that API and tell it to return something else in which case Nikita doesn't know that it's not actually the Android OS uh, responding, but it's actually me in between. I can also do less invasive techniques, so I can use uh, uh, dynamic binary instrumentation techniques. So I can, for example, run the application in one thread and then also run a tempered version of the application in another thread, and then just switch memory addresses for specific functions which basically means that the application is running completely properly in a normal environment, but instead it's actually using my data as input. I can customize system images. I can make my own rooted kernel modules. I can basically do whatever I want, and it's really hard to, to prevent all these different types of attacks. Starting from scratch, maybe there is a possibility to deter the attacker. Maybe we can make our, uh, our application uh, temper-proof and we can obfuscate it to the point that the attacker cannot even understand what's happening inside. So let's talk about the co code obfuscation. Our goal will be to complicate the human analysis as much as possible. Let's start with simple things. Let's just rename everything that is inside uh, the, our application and make the names meaningless and completely uh, unintelligible for the attackers. For example, instead of a method that is self-descriptive, uh, we will have some less human-readable things that the attackers have to guess. Yeah. Well, this is really frustrating for me. I mean, before I could just see it was an encrypt function, and now I'm just seeing an M1 function, which really doesn't tell me all that much. But I can see that there is a byte array being parsed. And if I look to see what the contents of that byte array are, I might actually see that this is a key coming by, or this is some plain text data that should actually be encrypted in the system, so I can still use extra metadata around these functions to see what this is. And if I'm reversing the application, I can just make a comment in my code to say that M1 is actually an encryption function. So yes, it makes it a lot more difficult, but still it's not impossible. Let's see what we can make next. Let's try to encrypt all the string information, all the string constants that we have in the, in the application to make the strings incomprehensible and completely useless for the attacker. Imagine that we have a cipher spec somewhere in the code. The attacker sees that cipher spec and immediately understands that there is some crypto happening there. But the obfuscator will insert a function that will decrypt that in runtime, but in static analysis, the attacker will have difficulties understanding what's happening there. Yeah, again, this is really annoying, because, I mean, if I see this, I have no idea what this is actually doing. 
but I'm looking through the code and I'm seeing a lot of really weird strings and I'm seeing a lot of functions called M2. So I'm going to actually try to look into what M2 is now doing. I'm seeing that every time that I look through the, this assembled code, I'm seeing a function M2 with some string argument, which is then being used as a string, which will then be used in some other thing. So if I'm using this string S1 in my M1 function, I'm seeing that this is probably some encryption uh, function. And here, if I reverse this method, I can actually see what's happening. So unless it's using some kind of dynamic instrumentation or some dy dynamic algorithm, generally it's just a static algorithm. So if I just reverse that algorithm, I can just deobfuscate all these strings. I replace them in place in my deobfuscated code. And then I just have all the strings in plain text again. So it's a bit of a hassle, but well, I don't really see a big issue here. Well, let's try to completely hide the program logic uh, and prevent the decompiling because all the things we didn't were valid for the decompiled code. Let's try to run some kind of obfuscation tool on our program that completely messes the uh, flow of the program, that inserts random jump statements in the binary that will not make it possible for the decompiler to produce any human readable code and the attacker will have to reverse to read in the assembly. So this is also something that I can uh, get around. So generally, if you have code that's automatically converted into something really difficult looking, then there's some kind of algorithm behind that. So with some binary analysis techniques and some automation, I can probably still recover what was originally the code. Because if I see these same blocks of functions happening again and again, I can probably see what is actually done, do being done there and just replace that with a much simpler function and in that way go back to the original functionality. Let's go further. We have Java code. Java has reflection and can load the bytecode dynamically. Maybe we can uh, utilize that and force the attacker to really go dynamic in that. Uh, all, the func all the calls in the uh, code that the attacker will see will be renamed to more meaningless things that he will not be able to read him by himself. Wow, you're really making it difficult for me. Yeah, so now we can do dynamic analysis. So basically I can run the application. And since I can hook every function that's being done, I can actually just have it print every method name that is being called. Or I can actually go through and see here we're getting some string which is telling us which class to get and which method to hook. And these are probably obfuscated, but with the, the obfuscation techniques I already expressed, I can just figure out which class is being called here, in which case that will probably be something along the lines of crypto.rand. And even if you rename this so it's calling a class M, I already know that M was actually a crypto function, so going back step by step, I can actually still recover what the code is doing. Let's try to go a little bit deeper. We have native code in our application, most probably, and we'll try to apply all the state-of-the-art techniques that have been used for uh, native code development on other platforms, not for Android. We can use self-modifying code. We can use the obfuscator that will completely mess up the control flow graph by flattening it and removing the loops and setting jumps all over the place. We can use the obfuscator that inserts opaque predicates, and basically dummy code that does nothing, but for the attacker it will be really frustrating to understand. We can use the obfuscator that does arithmetic transformations on all the expressions that happen inside our code. Instead of the normal assignments, instead of the normal calculations, we will have lots of XORs, shifts, and other things that will be more difficult to understand for a human attacker. The obfuscator can manipulate the variables in registers and stack, and lots of other things. Yeah, so now it's getting really difficult for me because I have to know both Java and the native code. Uh, in both in the, the bytecode and in the assembly versions. So now I'm really having to, to look into the hooks from Java to the, the native code, the native code to the assembly, and all that kind of things. But for native code, we have these really nice disassemblers already, for example, IDA, which gives us really nice control flow graphs. And if we have a very nice control flow graph, even if it's flattened, we can kind of see what the code is doing. If we have a flattened control flow graph, like this one, for example, then, yeah, that makes it a lot more difficult. So this function was originally just a while loop, and with his flow flattening and obfuscation, it now became this. And that is indeed a lot more difficult. So 
I'm going to have to spend quite a bit of time trying to figure out what this function actually does. But in the end, I'm sure that I will actually replace this and see that it is just a while loop. So I will prevail, but it will just take me quite a bit longer. But technically, nothing prevents me from using an attacker or an obfuscator that will complicate the control as much as possible. There has been a nice example of uh, a research how to make the control flow really frustrating to the attacker. When the attacker opens the application in the disassembler, he will see something really nasty. Well, I hope that all the techniques I used will re slow the reverse engineering of my application as much as possible. Yeah. So this is a short summary of the different types of attacks that you can do on uh, obfuscation. So there is basically uh, automated deobfuscation, which is just uh, if you have Java bytecode, just reverse it back into Java. Uh, that will generally work. You will get some kind of code. It might not be readable, but it will generally re deliver something that you can actually uh, recompile and run again. You have descriptable disassemblers, decompilers, debuggers. Basically, those allow you to also do in-place in replacements. So like example, I... I uh, found the M2 function, which will replace the jarbled string with the original string. If I make a script that does that for me, I can actually implement that in my disassembler, and it will replace the strings in place, which means that it will no longer be as difficult to read the code that is uh, there. I can dump the code in runtime. So every time a function is called, I can just print the name of the method, as I already pointed out. I can do uh, advanced program analysis, so I can use an SAT solver or an SMT solver or symbolic execution to figure out what the program is actually doing, and based on that, just trace it through the code to see what is actually happening. I can attack the JVM, because Java bytecode runs on top of a JVM, so if I just attack the virtual machine itself, then I'm one layer lower, and I don't really care what the application is doing. I can see all the calls to the operating system and all the calls to memory, etc. so I still know what the application is effectively doing. But indeed, it all costs a lot more manual effort because it's not, long, not as easy to do as it was originally. Well, I may always want to bind my application to the device so that once the attacker starts to investigate the application and reverse engineer on his device, he will not get the same results. The attackers may want to exfiltrate some of the key material from the application to take the attack and sign the transactions. So we'll try to capture an unique fingerprint from the device by accessing the environment properties, firmware versions, patch levels, and whatever, and make all the cryptography inside our application dependent on the hash of this fingerprint. We can also try to use the hardware-backed features when possible. If there is a hardware-backed store in the phone, even if it's a small percentage, we can use that for our advantage and bind the device to the secret information that never leaves the hardware secure element. That should be easier because we're not making payments with that secure element. We're just using the key store, which is the standard feature of the devices that support it. Yeah. So indeed, there is a lot of different attacks that I can do on this as well. Uh, some are more effective than others. Uh, but as Nikita already pointed out, a lot of devices don't actually have a hardware implementation of some trusted element. So effectively, all the information that is being used for device binding is just that, it's information. It's being requested through specific APIs and specific interfaces. Um, using these interfaces, these are just method calls, so I can also hook these, I can see what information is being requested, and then on my personal attacking device, I can just spoof this information, tell the application that I'm using the same credentials, and then it will be quite difficult for it to actually detect that I'm running on a spoofed phone. Um, yeah, that pretty much covers everything in this slide. <coughs> well, there is still a possibility to use the hardware features of the phone that are available. As I have said, we can try to use the secure element that may be present on some phones, but we are not going to provision the whole payment application into it and face these challenges, but we will at least try to put some key material inside it so with the features provided by the operating system itself. The newer Android versions provide that. It might help us and help, might mitigate the key exposure risk because some of the key material can be still stored in the secure element if it's present. There is also a new trend of having the trusted execution environments of the smartphones. It's still relatively rare, it's only a handful of devices present, but it's the new trend and 
we see that more devices are getting this. The trusted execution environment is basically the uh, technology that aims to provide the same kind of hardware assurance that the smart card have by having a dedicated chip on the uh, phone and having a secure operating system inside it that has limited interfaces. We're not going to dive deep, but still it's a mitigation option that the developer can use if it's really present. The next thing is that uh, we might use the white box cryptography. That's uh, not a new con uh, thing, but still, if we have a key present somewhere uh, in software storage. Then I want to get it. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, then I'll try to at least uh, transform the cryptography in such a way that the key is dissolved into the algorithm itself or into some kind of information that is really, really obfuscated. The strength of this solution is that basically the, I am expanding the algorithm by a factor of 10 or 100, so the code uh, becomes too large for the attacker to manually analyze or even to analyze with some scripting tools. The manual reverse engineering is very hard for the white box. I'm trying to diversify the instances between devices, so the key material will be uh, dependent on the device fingerprints. Uh, I will obfuscate the key and uh, maybe even develop per device code. But of course, such a solution also has weaknesses. So the white box will actually hide the key, but it will not actually hide the function, because if I execute the white box, I can still see what it's actually doing, because if you give inputs for example, the ciphertext into the white box, there's still a ciphertext going in and the plain text coming out, so I can still see what is actually happening. I can compare that to a normal implementation. So if I compare this white box function to a regular encryption function, I can still see memory accesses in probably the same locations, and I can try to compare those to see if there are like uh, resemblances or bits that are like corresponding to each other and that kind of things. Additionally, if the device binding is not very good, I can also just lift this entire thing onto my rooted device and just impersonate the application, tell it to do some signing with his key, and it's still undetectable that I'm not actually Nikita doing the payment. It's quite an immature technology, so there have been a lot of white papers and research papers written about white boxes. There have been a lot of papers written about uh, attacking white boxes. And one of our colleagues actually did a presentation at Black Hat on unboxing the white box, which has a number of different uh, practical attacks against white boxes. So yeah, if you want to know more about that, uh, feel free to read the paper. So for this kind of things, uh, generally, you know about the tools that developers use. But an attacker also has a number of different tools. So let's uh, think what kind of classes so, of tools the attackers can use. So the first thing the attacker does is the static analysis. So we'll have the decompilers, the disassemblers, and various unpacking tools for all the uh, executable formats that he's going to use. The next step is the dynamic analysis. The attacker will start debugging, tracing the code, injecting the hooks, or using dynamic binary manipulations. The attackers will also have some tools to maybe uh, circumvent our countermeasures. So there will be anti-debugging, anti anti-root detection, anti-emulation, anti and so on. There are powerful emulators that can do replay. Um, Panda is the most uh, well-known of that. So the whole uh, environment can be replayed uh, in an emulator like QEMU, specifically modified for that. And the attackers may as well even tools for side-channel fault injection on the cryptography implementation, especially for white box cryptography. There are also lots of domain-specific tools for EMV, NFC, and cryptography, and the calculators that both the attackers and even developers sometimes use. Yeah, so for Android, there's also like, uh, you've heard that there's a lot of different classes of tools. I'm going to give you a couple of different uh, examples of such tools. So for routing, one of the old and popular ones is Tileroot. Uh, Tileroot is quite a, a popular one because at that point there were very little root exploits for Android available, and then Tileroot came out, and basically that wiped the entire Android ecosystem by storm, and practically all devices could be rooted with this one. Uh, every couple of months, new exploits come out that allow you to gain root, even on the newest devices. So I know that the Galaxy X6 by Samsung, for example, has also an exploit out on the market, and that's quite a new phone. Um, there's the SDK development kit. You might say that is purely focused for developers, but if I'm an attacker and I want to develop my malware, it's really easy if I can also use the Android standard libraries. It makes me uh, really 
it makes it easier for me to, to develop my malware quickly and to adjust it and even update it on the fly using the Google Play Store because if I hide my well, malware well enough, I can just update, push updates, and then all my people that have been infected just get updated on the fly. There's in inspection tools like EnderGuard, which basically allow you to, in, uh, to open an application to see what it's doing. There's a decompiler. So for example, JEP is a well-known decompiler that allows you to take an APK file and to basically parse it back into Java code. So you can just see the source code of what the application was, even if it's been compiled and obfuscated in between. There's disassemblers. So JEP is also disassembler, but also IDA. So if you're doing native code assembly or that kind of thing, you can use IDA for that. There's debuggers, so if I'm running a program and I want to see what it's actually doing in memory, I can use a debugger to see what the accesses are or what functions are being called. There's a lot of instrumentation frameworks, so a number of them are ADD, ADBI, DDI, Frida, Substrate, Expose, LD Preload even works to, to instrument these kind of things. And if you're attacking white boxes or using side channel or fault injection attacks, Riskier has its own software for that kind of things, uh, which we also use when we're attacking our products. And basically, that allows you to attack a white box and to get the keys directly from it without having to do any reverse engineering or anything on the white box. So that leads us to almost to the conclusions. There's a couple of things that if you're developing for Android, you really should keep in mind. The first of these things is that we are developing an application. We have to think that the distance and time and space really raises the cost for the attacker. Uh, the cloud solutions for HC payment, they should have some kind of control over the payment credentials of the keys using to send the, uh, sign the cryptograms. These keys must really be limited. Instead of the classic smart card model where the key, smart card has a key that is signing the cryptograms over the all of the lifetime of the card. Here, the limited use credentials must be controlled and used for only once per transaction. And the backend so that sits in the cloud has the possibility to do risk management and implement various security controls, check devices, and so on. The next thing to think uh, is the security is a moving target. The main idea is to outrun the attacker, not to outsmart them. The development process has to be fast and agile, and the security evaluation has to be embedded into it from start as early as possible. Um, but unfortunately, the mobile platform security is still low by the smart card standards. Devices will be compromised, even hardware may be compromised at some point. And that brings us to our conclusions. So our first conclusion is smartphones are not secure platforms. You should not expect it to be secure. And if you're going to be trying to do some stuff that needs a secure platform, we really recommend that you do stuff in the back end and only use the phone as an untrusted interface to that back end and not try to put security stuff on the phone itself because yeah, that's bound to fail. So mobile payment apps need additional security. Uh, like we already pointed out, everything that you're doing on the mobile phone itself is liable to be hacked. It might take a day, it might take two days, it might take a month. It depends on who's attacking and what they're interested in, but if it's interesting enough, they're bound to get to it. So there's several new concepts that are emerging uh, that may enable secure apps. So for secure elements, there's still way too many vendors and way too many issuers that are trying to agree on which vendors should support which issuers. But s features like TEE or, t or uh, similar style things are emerging which allow you to actually write trusted applets which run in a secure environment, which can only interface with the rich operating system. And that allows you to have a subset of people that are trusted, which means that there's very uh, secure code running on a secure area, which makes it a lot more difficult for an attacker to actually get to that. And then finally, <coughs> evaluation can help investigate, and identify, and mitigate any risks. So if you're developing, what we currently often see is that an app, uh, some developers decide to create an application or a wallet application. They develop the entire software, then they come to Riskier and say, well, can you test this for us? And then we basically blow huge holes into the application. And we're like, yeah, we're pointing out this is wrong and this is wrong and this is wrong. And ideally, we would be interested in getting to talk to the developers from the start before they start designing the application so they can keep the security mindset in mind while developing and we can help evaluate the, the choices they're making during the, the drawing, during the drafting, before they actually start even writing code to help them see where they might actually make mistakes and yeah, lose their assets. And that concludes our presentation. If you have any questions, please feel free to come ask us after the presentation. And, uh,
Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you.